everyone and thank you for joining us today and welcome to uh, CRM's Africa Talk Sports webinar number 14. My name is uh, Mustafa Sal, founder of CRM's, a Senegalese agency specialized in sports, international relations, and even management. And also the, uh, the Africa Talk Sports uh, initiator, which is designed to bring together and create a dialogue across the Africa sport world on how we can tackle opportunities and the major challenge that our sports movement is facing. As global sports continue to experience the use of uh, performance improvement drugs and other substance by both elite and amateur athletes, uh, this has means that the World Anti-Doping Agency over the years continue to promote safe and clean sport among uh, athletes and sex holds. In Africa, uh, doping is gradually becoming uh, a continental issue, especially in elite sports, despite the presence of water institution in, um, and program on the continent. And um, on the backdrop of this, question has been asked about um, how to strengthen the roles and responsibility of WADA, uh, regional organization and office across the continent. And that's why that's the reason why we at CRMs consider the hosting of this webinar today by inviting African anti-doping experts on the continent to discuss on the topic of WADA and the global anti-doping program rules and responsibility of those involved. So before handing, handing it to our moderator of the day, uh, Mrs. Anna, member of WADA education committees and general secretary of the uh, Zimbabwe National Olympic Committees, uh, I would like to thank once again all of the, um, the speakers and particip participants uh, for making themselves available to share their experience and expertise with us today on this panel. So without ado, um, I will let Mrs. Anna to start the panel to so enjoy the debate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mustafa. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to those who might be in different places. Hello, Africa, and welcome to this session that we're having. I think uh, Mustafa has already outlined some of the key areas as to why Africa Talk Sports is actually covering this um, um, online series, these webinar conferences. We want to be able to promote and continue dialogue on the African continent and with a broad spectrum of stakeholders. But this particular one is just going to be focusing on the issue of anti-doping and how critical that is uh, as we go forward, because um, it's, it's, it's an aspect of health, it's an aspect of uh, medical aspects, which we really need to look at, and that's important for our athletes. And one of the key focus areas is our athletes on the African continent are not just competing within their regions or on the continent, but we want excellence on a global uh, perspective. We want to reach the highest levels of, of performance, but all the time maintaining the mantra of clean sports. So our session today, um, provides opportunity for us to talk with this different mode of communication. We're not necessarily um, going to be able to meet physically, but we're going to be able to do this online um, amid the global pandemic and be able to talk about the anti-doping program. So we are having today with us four specific um, panelists, um, and I'll just introduce them briefly by name because they will introduce themselves just before their presentations. We have Mr. Rodney Svigala, who's the director of uh, WADA's Africa Regional Office, and he's been in that position since 2003. Dr. Nicholas Munyonga, who's the chair of Africa's Zone 6 uh, Regional Anti-Doping Organization. Uh, we have in our midst an Olympian. Dr. Olivia Aya Nakitanda, who's head of the anti-doping uh, agency in the NOC in Uganda. And she's also a member of the WADA Health Medical and Research Committee. And then we have uh, Mr. Jafta Rugut, who is chairperson, sorry, CEO of the anti-doping uh, agency of Kenya. To all our panelists, uh, good afternoon. I think you're all in an afternoon zone and welcome. We're certainly going to hear a lot from you. But just before we actually get into the, the topic of the day, um, 
we, we recognize that we have a wide spectrum of listeners and, and uh, participants joining us in the session. And we're going to try and keep this as broad as possible to be able to bring through the basics and the understanding. We know we're moving into a new uh, code in 2021. So there are certain roles and responsibilities that will be shifted from certain entities to our NOCs, to our ADOs that we need to be really clear about. And um, just to get our topic started, I, I'm not going to go into uh, major introductions. I'm simply just going to go straight into um, the topics of the day. And I'm going to start with, with you, Rodney. And perhaps just by way of background, to give us a more precise and concise appreciation of what is the anti-doping global program? How is it organized? And, and really, what is WADA's role? So we are, um, you know, we're, we're, we're on the same page, really. That's what we want to do. We'll allow you to introduce yourself, give us a short intro, and then let's get straight into it. Uh, thank you, Anna, um, and, uh, and, and, and Mustafa and your team, thank you for organizing this very important session. I believe that the more we talk about these matters, the more uh, we can reach out to uh, uh, our brothers and sisters throughout the region um, to highlight the importance of anti-doping. As Anna mentioned, I am the director of WADA's Africa office uh, since 2003, and we based in uh, Cape Town, South Africa. Anna, do you want me to uh, answer your question? Yeah, go ahead, Rodney. Thank you. Very that's, that's important. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. It's, I'm very happy to provide a, a very general overview of WADA and some of the key issues uh, that we deal with and that, uh, and that we anticipate and expect our, our partners to do. Of course, WADA was created in uh, 1999 to coordinate and harmonize the global fight against doping. We are a regulatory body of all things anti-doping, uh, and we were essentially created in the first instance to protect the health and future of athletes. Of course, their right to participate in free and fair sport is paramount. To achieve this, WADA first had to develop and adopt together with our stakeholders, a set of rules which would be applicable in every country and in every sport. This is how the World Anti-Doping Code came into existence in 2003. To ensure that governments can adopt this set of rules, the United Nations Education, Sport, Culture um, organ, the UNESCO, developed an international convention against doping in sport which has now been ratified by 189 countries globally. The code must change and adapt with the times, which is why it remains a living document. As such, WADA from time to time leads processes to update, review, and revise the code to ensure that it remains relevant and up to date. The latest of these processes was initiated by WADA with the participation of all our stakeholders two years ago, a process which culminated in the unanimous adoption of a revised code in Poland, uh, Katowice in Poland uh, in 2019. And this code, this revised version of the code will come into force on the 1st of January, 2021. To complement and elaborate on the code's principles, international standards were developed, adopted, uh, and are mandatory for all signatories. Currently, the following standards are in place to ensure that there is harmonization in the anti-doping process. We have the International Standard for Testing and Investigations, which sets forth the process of testing athletes and, and, and the expectations when it comes to investigations by our uh, testing authorities and, and anti-doping organizations. We have the International Standard for Therapeutic Use Exemptions, which are all related to a process through which an athlete that is in need to take a substance or, or undergo a method that is on the list of prohibited substances and method can be under certain conditions uh, uh, allowed to use those medications. We have the International Standard for Laboratories through which we accredit uh, the WADA accredited laboratories. 
And we have the International Standard for Protection of Privacy and Personal Information. That is to ensure that no information of athletes um, that's sensitive, that is personal, are, are, are shared with those that, that do not need to have that kind of information in their possession and to ensure uh, that those rights of athletes are protected. We also have the International Standard for Code Compliance by signatories, and I will return to this a little bit later. And then, of course, we have the list of uh, prohibited substances and methods, which is um, a process that takes water approximately one year, and every year on the 1st of January, the list that will be in force uh, for a particular year uh, 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 then comes yeah, into force on the 1st. With the latest revision of the code, two new international standards were adopted and will come into force on 1, on one January uh, 2021. There is a bit of an echo. I don't know if there's a mic on maybe somewhere. Is, is it OK? Uh, so with the latest revision of the code, there will be two new standards that will come into force. The first one is the International Standard for Education which essentially underlines the importance of ensuring that athletes and those supporting them in their careers receive adequate, relevant, and timely anti-doping education and information. The second standard is the new international standard for results management, which was developed to ensure that the results management in case of an anti-doping rule violation is done in a way that ensures fairness and the protection again of the rights of those implicated. These are the two new standards. Back to education, which I think we all agree is, is critical in the whole uh, uh, anti-doping program. We continue to develop and promote education resources that stakeholders can use when developing and rolling out their programs. WADA's anti-doping e-learning platform, or ADEL, contains various tools geared towards the different stakeholders, role players, and anti uh, uh, in anti-doping, and is absolutely free of charge. WADA has also implemented a code implementation support program, or CISP, to assist our signatories to be able to implement the changes to the code and ensure uh, compliance thereof. As the global regulator of anti-doping, WADA's role in monitoring and implementing of the code and standards is paramount. In this regard, and with the introduction and coming into force of the revised code on 1 January 2021, we are now working towards ensuring that signatories those are our international federation, our, uh, our national anti-doping organizations, our uh, uh, regional anti-doping organizations, um, and also national Olympic committees uh, that, uh, that are the de facto NADOs in countries where there is no independent national agency, that they develop and adopt revised anti-doping rules, which will also come into force on the 1st of January. This is critical since anti-doping in countries or in territories cannot just happen in a vacuum. And without proper rules in place, which are supported and respected by all role players in the country, it's going to be very difficult to enforce those processes. Secondly, and in order to assist in identifying and addressing non-conformities by stakeholders in their programs to the tenets of the code, WADA has developed a, a very broad, uh, continuous monitoring program. Through this program, all code signatories completed a code compliance questionnaire in 2016. And based on their answers to these questions, WADA then in 2017 provided um, uh, corrective measures to our stakeholders that they can implement to ensure that their programs are compliant. We continue to follow up with our stakeholders uh, on, on, on the anti-doping programs and to monitor them and to make sure that their programs are in line, again, uh, so that the process is coordinated, that it is harmonized in all countries. It must be the same for anti-doping to succeed. Um, it should also be remembered that non-compliance with the World Anti-Doping Code 
could lead to put possible sanctions as set forth in the international standard for compliance. Again, all of these measures are put in place to ensure that we protect our key stakeholder, our athletes. It is also for the benefit of athletes that the Athlete Anti-Doping Rights Act was developed by WADA's Athlete Committee in consultation with thousands of athletes and stakeholders worldwide and adopted by WADA's Executive Committee. This document outlines the rights and the responsibilities of athletes as well as other stakeholders uh, in the anti-doping program. Of course, Anna, there's a lot more that can be said about um, the, the roles and responsibilities of our stakeholders, but I think that considering the fact that we have our national, national anti-doping organizations and, and regional anti-doping organizations represented here, uh, I will leave it up to them to, uh, uh, to advise and, and, and tell us about their programs and what they are doing to ensure uh, compliance with the World Anti-Doping Code. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rodney. But just before I let you go, and I know there will also be questions coming in, just to remind everybody that you have the chat uh, platform on, on Zoom as well as Facebook to ask questions. Rodney, do we have any gaps on the continent at all in terms of compliance? You spoke about signatories um, to the code. Do we still have gaps uh, on the continent that you can probably just quickly highlight? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, And uh, Yes, sure. Uh, I mean, there's always room for improvement. Uh, I always say that that in Africa, we do not have a very long anti-doping tradition. Uh, for some other parts of the world, they've had systems in place for a very long time. Uh, so for us, uh, the past 20 years has been uh, an exercise in developing and, 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 and uh, putting into place the necessary structures. What I can say that in terms of gaps in the region, we still do not have uh, a sufficient numbers of national anti-doping organizations that are established or were established through acts of parliament that could sustain them, that could ensure their longevity and that they are able uh, to be resourced. And I mean, that they are resourced to do the kind of things that they are supposed to do. So our call is repeatedly to our, our government uh, uh, context to ensure uh, that as per the tenets of the UNESCO Convention, that they resource, uh, uh, legislate and, and ensure that they empower the existence of a national anti-doping organization. It is because of a lack of these independent bodies and, and Jafta uh, will, will speak about the agency in Kenya and what they do, uh, but because uh, there's no such structures in, in, in many of our countries, more than 50% of African countries do not have these agencies, it then becomes the responsibility of NOCs, uh, who then becomes the de facto NADOs uh, in countries. And this is very difficult because NADO, uh, NOCs' uh, key goal is, of course, the preparation of athletes. And of course, anti-doping is part of that process. But the need for more national agencies in the region cannot be overemphasized, and and that is taking up quite a, a a lot of time. But of course, you can you can develop a structure, but then it must be resourced. And we find too many times that structures are developed through a mechanism, uh, but then when it comes to resourcing, take COVID nineteen for example. What has happened is that our government partners had to use. Um, monies perhaps set aside for clean sport and uh, and the protection of the integrity of sport and had to divert that of course to the bigger issue which was fighting COVID-19 and making sure that the health systems can uh, can can uh, they can respond to that adequately for for the people but if it was an act of parliament and and those resources are ring fenced it's secured then at least in many of these countries uh, we would have been sure that NADOs would have been able to, to go on. And I think that's the next step, because we want, must ensure that whilst we understand countries having to rebudget, having to refocus their, their financial resourcing uh, to, of course, prioritize uh, the fight against COVID, we need to ensure that uh, as part of mitigating the negative impact of COVID, uh, that once we move out of this and we are 
slowly but surely getting out of this that the 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 rados uh, the national agencies and the regional agencies can continue to be a, a resource to be able to uh, to implement their uh, responsibilities under the code absolutely almost like a two-pronged attack thank you so much for that um rodney uh, maybe just to say good afternoon good morning to all those who are just joining us um to this topic on WADA and the Global Anti-Doping Program brought to you by Africa Talk Sports. So we've had a really global uh, perspective put through by Rodney, and now we're going to just bring it down. And Rodney alluded to um, uh, contributions coming in from Arado. And we have Dr. Nicholas Munyonga, who's chairperson of Africa's Zone 6 RADO on board with us. Nick, good afternoon. And my question to you, um, just drawing from what Rod uh, Rodney has spoken about, could you give us some specific interventions that have been made by RADOs on the, well, in this particular instance with your RADO on the continent? And, you know, with the changes that are coming through, what does this mean for the RADO? If you could just give us an outline on that. Doc is muted. We need to unmute. Yeah. Thanks. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Anna. Thank you, uh, Rodney, for, for that comprehensive um, intro. Obviously, very difficult then to follow uh, after you to speak about this, but it's created a good platform. My name is Dr. Nick Munyonga. I'm the chairperson of the regional anti doping organization for the Africa Zone 6. Um, I'm also chair of the medical and anti-doping services for the Africa Union Sports Council Region 5 for their um, uh, regional uh, games. So basically, I speak from um, a point of um, where Rodney mentioned that um, um, as, as Africa, uh, the tradition of anti-doping activities is uh, relatively uh, a 20 year or old program compared to other regions, um, to compared to other nations. Uh, it is one of these things that probably led to the World Anti-Doping uh, Agency in partnership with various governments and uh, national Olympic committees coming together to ensure that we create uh, these uh, regional anti-doping uh, organizations where various countries in geographical regions were uh, put together to ensure that they can work as a team in terms of coordinating and supporting the implementation of anti-doping uh, programs by member countries. So all in all, there are about 15, 15 radars um, uh, covering a span of about um, 132 countries. So you can see how countries have been, have been uh, brought into um, these regional uh, groupings where just 15 radars can then be able to assist 132 uh, countries uh, in terms of um, uh, anti-doping uh, programs. Uh, basically, uh, one of the key factors that we, the radars do is to uh, ensure that uh, member countries that are signatories to the World Anti-Doping Code uh, and also their governments having ratified uh, the UNESCO Convention should then be able to see how best uh, with limited resources they can be able to um, implement um, anti-doping uh, programs. They can be able to, 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 be, uh, to achieve compliance as far as the World Anti-Doping Code is concerned. I think uh, Rodney mentioned uh, the issue of um, uh, the code compliance uh, program, a comprehensive code compliance program supported by the international standard of code compliance. A good number of the things that are required uh, to be met as far as member states are concerned have been made possible through uh, the work of um, uh, these regional anti-doping uh, organizations. The Africa Zone 6 RADO was established uh, in May uh, 2006 and uh, it consists of um, uh, uh, 10 countries then, uh, that's Angola, Botswana, Lesotho, Malawi, Moz uh, Mozambique, Namibia, South Africa, Eswatini, Zambia, and uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, in 2013, 
we were then joined by Ghana from West Africa uh, to make us uh, 11 uh, nations, uh, which we are working together in terms of um, uh, implementation of anti-doping uh, programs. The strategic objective of our RAD basically is to make sure that we provide assistance, guidance, and leadership to these um, Africa Zone 6 countries. Uh, one, in terms of um, making sure that they uh, establish their national anti-doping uh, programs, uh, to make sure that they are compliant with both uh, the World Anti-Doping Code and uh, the UNESCO Convention. We also play a big role in terms of the education programs where we work to inform uh, the national Olympic committees in the region, the governments, uh, major sport organizers, uh, athletes and uh, athlete support personnel about the fight against doping in sport. We also work through to ensure implementation of um, uh, effective doping control programs. Uh, basically to prevent, deter, and detect uh, the use of doping in sport. So there is an element of the coordination of the doping control process uh, itself that happens at, um, at regional level. And um, also uh, because of uh, issues of limited resources within these member countries, the aspect of long-term sustainability of anti-doping programs is also of paramount importance uh, as far as um, uh, the, the, the anti-doping programs of the regions are concerned. Before the 2015 um, code, uh, I'm sure again Rodney mentioned that uh, the World Anti-Doping Code is a living document that uh, continuously undergoes review. So when the RADOs were formed, or when our RADO was formed in 2006, uh, the RADO did not have its own anti-doping rules. And uh, from that point, um, uh, uh, according to the review of the court processes and the coming in of the 2015 court, uh, RADOs were now recognized as entities with their own anti-doping rules, although they were not signatories. Uh, to the court. So one of the changes that is coming through as far as the new court and its effect on the RADO is that in the new court, the RADOs again will no longer have anti-doping rules, but uh, the individual members are the ones that are now required to develop and adopt code compliant national anti-doping rules. I think this is arising from the feedback as far as the um, consultative processes uh, that leads to a review of the code is concerned, where again, the aspect of pushing uh, and assisting member countries to establish their national anti-doping organizations could have then also slowed down on the over-reliance uh, of the uh, RAD rules uh, that were in place. So to me, this is a very significant positive development that feeds into the processes that he took place from the time the RADOs were established to the time that the 2015 code incorporated, uh, adopted that the RADOs be having their own rules. And now we, 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 we have a situation where the national um, uh, member states will now have their own national anti-doping rules. But one of the developments that happened in that 2015 court that also remains in place at the present moment is that as member states are having their own national anti-doping rules, they will still continue to delegate certain responsibilities to the RADO. So there is an element of a continu continuity process where you find that uh, after the code review process, after the adoption of national anti-doping rules, still the member states can delegate certain responsibilities to the RADO and the experiences and expertise that the RADOs have created within their regions in terms of the doping control testing, in terms of intelligence and investigations, in terms of education, therapeutic use exemptions, results management. Member states will continue to gain and benefit from the support that they get through the, the, the RADOs. So the RADOs have been, have been there to capacity 
capacitate and develop capacity within the member states. That's why the RADO can have a pool of uh, people trained in therapeutic use exemptions that can then be able to create the therapeutic use exemption committees for these member states and assist as far as uh, such requirements are concerned. The RADOs can also have resource management teams that can also assist as far as uh, uh, training of these uh, people within the member states as per their national anti-doping rules are concerned and also assist in terms of uh, uh, creation of even the appeals bodies that can be happen at RADO levels depending on the delegation of responsibilities that would have happened at member state uh, level. So there is still scope of um, the RADOs assisting member states in as much as RADOs will no longer have their own anti-doping rules uh, in, in the new court. And I think um, uh, also major sport organizers within the region can be able to create their own anti-doping rules related to their major sports organizations. And the RADOs can come in to provide technical support in terms of the um, actual implementation of anti-doping programs are concerned. So as, um, as, as, as the Zone 6 um, RADO, uh, basically our, our strategic plan uh, is centered on sustainability and accountability in terms of the anti-doping programs are concerned, where we want to make sure we continue to strengthen and sustain these um, systems by facilitating, assisting, and ensuring that the RADO becomes as much independent as possible as far as its operations and finances are concerned. And uh, also sound structures that are put in place um, uh, uh, founded on principles of good governance. And um, also capacity building, where we want to make sure we continue to develop and strengthen the anti-doping um, capacities of the RADO and the member countries, human resources. So the training, basically now as a RADO, we have been capacitated to make sure that we can be able to train um, basically all the support structures as far as national anti-doping organizations are concerned. We can train people in education, we can train doping control officers, we can train results management teams, we can train the therapeutic use exemption people because we have been able to build that capacity as far as the RADO is concerned and we would want to continue to ensure that uh, uh, we can be able to do that. Uh, obviously uh, compliance and program development you will find that see, as a RADO we want to continue to support our member countries to achieve compliance. Uh, code compliance achievement is a measure of um, implementation of anti-doping programs in the bigger picture, in the bigger space. And therefore, we want to make sure that things are happening, fostering collaboration and also pulling off resources. This is why as a RADO, we, we, we thrive in working together with uh, the regional body for the sports commissions, sports councils and ministries of sports, which is the Africa Union Sports Council Region 5. We also thrive in working together with the regional organization for national Olympic committees, uh, COSANOC, to make sure that as a team, we can be able to collaborate and pull resources together to make sure we are in this fight uh, as a team. So that element, uh, as well as uh, relations and engagement, where we also make sure that we work hand in hand with the ministries of sports, with the ministers of sports, as far as ensuring compliance with the uh, UNESCO convention um, requirements uh, is concerned and continue to update uh, the ministers of sports in the region, as far as where we are lacking uh, as a region is concerned, with the support of the WADA regional office, we are able to continuously send this message to the, to the ministers to ensure that we get the necessary support that allows the, 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 the RADO to fully function. That's what we, 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 we are doing. And we feel that even going forward from 2021, the scope for us to continue to support uh, member states is there. The, continue, the, uh, the scope for us to continue working together is there because uh, member states have got the option of delegating responsibilities to the RADO and the RADO must be found with the capacity to assist as far as those responsibilities uh, delegated to the RADO is concerned. Uh, the RADO will be there to ensure that those uh, 
national anti-doping rules approved for each of the member states are being applied in terms of um, uh, anti-doping programs uh, monitoring that we would do through the various uh, technical uh, committee members uh, that sit on the RADO board uh, that we will be working with to ensure that program implementation is an ongoing process. So uh, in brief, that's, uh, that's what we, we are there for. Uh, that's what we are doing uh, as a RADO, and that's what we will continue to be doing to support uh, the member states uh, that constitute our RADO as far as anti-doping program implementation is concerned. Thank you. Thanks so much, Doc. Um, I think just from, and, and I'm going to use the term lay person coming out of an NOC, uh, when we first got wind of the fact that uh, uh, issues were going to be changing and uh, individual states or individual entities had to have their own rules, I think it became a bit daunting um, to, to appreciate and understand what this would mean for every single, uh, whether it's an NOC or a, 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 an entity that is trying to take over this responsibility. But knowing that we have, we can still gain the support, obviously, from the Africa body and from the RADOs, I think is very comforting because it allows us to transition more smoothly. And, and I encourage all my colleagues uh, who are probably faced with the same daunting task of, my goodness, 2021, how are we going to work this, to be able to collaborate and ask the questions and have their hands held by the organizations that have already been there. So Doc, it's very critical what you have highlighted. I will come back to you and just ask about some challenges later. But um, at this stage, allow me just to again acknowledge the people who have uh, joined us on this uh, global anti-doping program brought to you by Africa Talk Sports and in particular just to acknowledge uh, Anoka Technical Director Ms. Ezera Chabangu who's also joined us on, on today's session. But now I'm going to bring it, I'm going to bring it really home now um, because the reason why we do all this, and Rodney highlighted right at the start, we were talking about protecting the health and welfare and the future of the athletes. And I'm going to turn to um, one of our renowned athletes who's now running with uh, an anti-doping agency, specifically in Uganda uh, with the NOC, Aya. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we could talk all day around this subject. Um, purporting to be the experts, even if we are, but you are the one who is affected. And I know probably all of us have been athletes at some stage, but I'm talking about a recent athlete. Um, Aya, during your time, just in terms of the information that is coming through, um, there's two questions I'm going to ask as an athlete. Was this very clear to you when you were participating as an athlete, how has it affected the work you're doing now, and particularly the aspect of research, which I know we, we, we tend to lag behind in many, many ways. So I'm going to allow you just to give us, um, you know, a sum up from an athlete perspective and an athlete who has since transitioned. Uh, welcome and thank you so much. Aya, sorry, we have to start you again because you're on mute. Excuse thank me. You. <laughs> thank okay. you, Anna. Yeah, thank you, Anna, for that accurate introduction. And thank, thank you, many thanks to Mustafa, the organizer, for this initiative and the opportunity to share my experiences in anti-doping from both an athlete and sports administrator perspective. So my name is Aya Nachtanda, and I'm currently the head of the anti-doping section at the National Olympic Committee of Uganda, a board member uh, of the Africa Zone 5 Regional Anti-Doping Organization, and also a member of the Health, Medical and Research Committee at the World Anti-Doping Agency. I've been in sport for a long time, considering that I started as an athlete, I represented Uganda in swimming for 10 years, during which period I competed in world championships at the Commonwealth Games, at the World University Games, and uh, the Beijing 2008 Olympic Games. 
professionally, I'm a medical doctor and I primarily work in public health, but I'm also trained in sports medicine, sports management, and anti-doping. So I've served in various leadership roles in sports locally and internationally. And uh, as we talk anti-doping, I would now like to get into the questions posed on me by, by Anna. I want to start by saying that uh, I'm not sure if I'm a recent athlete because I competed uh, at least more than 10 years ago. And I would say that a lot has changed uh, uh, in the Ugandan sports landscape. When I was competing, we were just I can speak for my sport. So we were just a handful of swimmers. But as of today, we have more than a thousand swimmers who are registered with clubs. And when you look at the events calendar for the Federation, you will see that it is packed with local, national, regional, continental, and international events. So that obviously means that we have increased participation in sports. And we also have athletes who are winning uh, at the continental and even international level. This I can say uh, uh, in athletics where traditionally we were actually stronger in the shorter distance sprint events, but increasingly in the last 10, 15 years, we are achieving more success in the middle and uh, long distance events. So the changes in sport in the last 10, 15 years has meant a lot in terms of the changing and increasing anti-doping needs in the country. But looking at the big picture of things, I want to say that you know sports doesn't exist in a bubble. Uh, Rodney has talked about the COVID situation and uh, sports is in many ways impacted a lot by the social and economic situation of the country. So I can say that uh, our economy in general has increased over these years. And it's definitely obvious that uh, there is increased disposable income and spending in sports from public authorities, from private companies, and even in households, people are spending more on sports. And this has translated into increased funding for sports. But unfortunately, I have to say that we have not yet uh, realized budgetary allocation for anti-doping in Uganda. Um, and uh, I would say that uh, we could attribute this to the fact that probably we as a country and our main stakeholders are still not aware or informed enough to realize that uh, anti-doping is actually a critical need in sport. And because they are not yet, we are not yet informed enough. Uh, some of our stakeholders do not know their roles and responsibilities. But I mean, this is not to say that nothing has been done. Uh, uh, I mean, we have a lot of ongoing projects and programs focusing on anti-doping. And I must say that uh, for the case of the Uganda Olympic Committee, we have taken deliberate steps to train hundreds of sports administrators in the country. So people are increasingly aware, uh, not only about anti-doping, but about sports management in general. And I can see this, there is really a change because as an athlete, uh, 10 or so years ago, I didn't know anything about doping or anti-doping, but because we have uh, implemented uh, education programs, uh, it's clear that our athletes are now uh, better prepared for international events. They are better educated. And uh, as a member of the WADA Education Committee, you know well that the main objective of the education program is to make sure that the first contact an athlete has with anti-doping is with education and not testing. Because if you go into testing without any information, it can be very daunting and scary. So, um, but then at the same time, I don't want to say that uh, we are at the level where we have done enough, considering our level of participation in sports, our level of performance in sports, 
Uh, there is more that we need to do. We need more resources. We need more expertise to keep up with the increasing and changing needs of anti-doping. And this brings me to your second question about research. I uh, honestly believe that research is important because it gives us as an anti-doping organization the basis to identify and justify our needs for increased resources. However, at this point, we do not really have the resources or the, or the expertise to be able to conduct good research. So we are not in a position, for example, to compete for the, let's say the water grants. I, I sit on the health medical and research committee and I know how competitive these grants are. We definitely do not have the capacity at the moment to be able to be given these grants. But uh, we actually try to take, we as a National Olympic Committee try to take some steps back because we realized that before even thinking about research, we lacked basic empirical data on our anti-doping program. For example, we were not reporting to our stakeholders what exactly we are doing and we are achieving as an anti-doping organization. So we started with um, having an annual report where we report on our testing figures because some of our stakeholders actually didn't know that we do testing. And we also uh, report on anti-doping rule violations because people are still not aware that we actually have cases of anti-doping rule violations in Uganda. And also to show what exactly we are doing in, with regards to our education programs. So I think this empirical data is, is also very important and sets the basis for future programs. And we hope that we can do more research in the future. My predecessor at the National Olympic Committee has previously conducted research on supplement use among athletes, on knowledge, attitude, and practices among athletes in collaboration with academic institutions. And probably this is the way forward. If we collaborate with institutions that have more resources, that have more expertise, then we will be in position to, to participate and conduct uh, research. So I think uh, within our region, collaborating even with uh, the more established anti-doping organizations like Kenya, Ethiopia, and Egypt would uh, really take us far in doing uh, research in future. Thank you. Aya, thank you very much. Um, I'm frantically making notes as 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 you are speaking, and I just wanted to get your 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 quick op opinion on the fact that you do highlight that we don't have enough information, enough research done. How detrimental do you think it is to our planning? And I and I don't want um, Rodney to have a heart attack when I ask this question, but. Are we really planning meaningfully if we or we are noting that we have got these gaps? What is your take on it? Is it affecting our planning and how we are, um, let's say, delivering on our specific anti-doping programs? What's your what's your take on that? And I'm not going to ask you to speak for Uganda. I'm just asking you to speak in general from your experience. Yeah, definitely. Research is important because it's information not just for researchers, but for anti-doping organizations and uh, public authorities. And we can use it in many ways, for example, to lobby for resources, but to also enlighten uh, different stakeholders. It could even be athletes, it could be researchers, it could be academicians about what's happening in, uh, uh, in anti-doping. So I would say that the lack of research impacts all aspects of the anti-doping program. And uh, I mean, currently, because we do not have a lot of information, we use what is available. But then because it is not contextualized, we are, not, we are definitely not sure if we are basing our justifications for certain programs, for certain priorities based on the right information. 
So it, it impacts hugely. And I would also say that uh, within uh, results management and uh, the monitoring of athlete biological passports, we don't have so much research done on our athletes. So some of the parameters, some of the, 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 the normal ratios and ranges that are used to determine uh, analytical, um, adverse analytical findings are not based on uh, our athletes. And uh, you know that 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 can affect an athlete terribly because they're using data that was probably used on um, that, that was generated from a different population, and they could be completely different from us. So I strongly believe that uh, the lack of data really impacts different aspects of uh, anti-doping. But then at the same time, having basic empirical data is a good starting point because. Yeah. You have to show what you're doing yeah. to be able to do more. You can't ask for more without taking care of the basics. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Aya. And, and Rodney, uh, I'll let you come in on that so you can just give us your perspective before we jump on to um, getting the example from Kenya. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Anna. And, and I didn't, it was, it was not intentional that I'm jumping on board, but I, 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 I am very much interested in research and so is the organization I represent and therefore we have two sets of uh, research grants available. On the one is the pure science um, uh, grant that we have available uh, and on the other hand we have a social uh, research grant that is also available. What we see at WADA is that there's not a lot as Aya knows that there's not a lot of uh, uh, research projects emanating from this region submitted uh, to us for review uh, by our expert group groups. And one of the things that we need to do as Africa is to empower ourselves. As Aya said, I think the, the issue of sometimes uh, if we focus on our national level um, uh, data that we want to expand upon, it might be a very narrow uh, uh, um, a set of data, but it, what if we collaborate more? What if there's an East African, a strong East African project being submitted? Um, and, and perhaps sometimes at the national anti-doping organizations, uh, they might not have the capacity to do research, uh, not because they don't want to, but simply because research is a very specialized area but nothing prevents us from engaging with our educational institutions, with our research institutions, with the universities, make them aware of the availability of such grants, see how they can through partnerships uh, engage their other colleagues in other countries in the region uh, and submit joint projects for us. I think that would be a much stronger proposal on the table. And it's something that we are actively advocating. Um, just one last point on, on that is that we have seen already several uh, 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 African countries involved with collaborations with European or, or Australasian uh, uh, research institutions. Uh, and I think for our own empowerment as Africa, I think we should be now also focusing on these um, African partnerships to see how we can use that information uh, to assist and empower our region. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rodney, and um, for, for coming in with that very interesting point. I'm just trying to also pick up all the key points that are coming out of all the discussions and collaboration, that word keeps coming in. Uh, yourself, Nicholas said the same thing, and Aya has alluded to that. Um, but uh, Aya already introduced us to uh, um, some organizations that are already doing quite successfully in terms of uh, the fight against doping in sport on the continent. And uh, she alluded, she gave the examples of Ethiopia, Egypt, South Africa, and of course she mentioned Kenya. And we do have with us Jafta. Um, and I'm gonna ask Jafta to come on board now because the anti-doping agency of Kenya clearly appears to be pretty functional uh, as an entity, both having successes, but not without their challenges. And perhaps you can give us some insight in terms of uh, what do you attribute the strengths of uh, uh, the anti-doping agency in Kenya to? What systems and structures do you actually have in place? And what learning points um, can we gain as um, 
other anti-doping organizations. So good afternoon and welcome to you, Jafda. Jafta, you'd have to unmute your mic if you're having a chat with us already. Mustafa, are you able to assist there or have we lost Jafta? No, I think he's online. Uh, that's what he told me kind of like a few minutes ago. Yeah. Okay, until we get a response from him, um, we'll allow him to come in at some stage. Maybe one of the things I'll do is obviously now just go to questions that we have, and we had one on Facebook, and I will pose it to uh, either Rodney, Nicholas, or Aya. I'll just read out the question for you, and uh, we can have uh, one of you to actually address it. How can sports science, exercise science, and resistance training science deal with this problematic factor? For instance, science can have recommendations, but if doping is used, the athlete or trainee will not follow these recommendations. For instance, heavy load, high volume leads to hypertrophy. And what if trainees use doping to recover? How can we be objective? Okay, I think that's the question. I, I'll also pop it into our uh, group chat, guys, if you want to have a look at it. Um, very science related. Uh, maybe you can simplify that with an answer. I'm not sure who would like to address that particular question. I, I know maybe this is Rodney. Uh, maybe I can just start. And 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 I know that uh, Dr. Munyonga uh, or even Aya would be very happy to, to, to discuss the science and the medicines uh, uh, behind that. From water's standpoint, of course, the areas that the uh, that the caller or the uh, uh, the person that submitted the question uh, mentioned, I think those are all the areas that we look at from a scientific position in some of the strategies that we employ, especially when it comes to testing, uh, where the physiology and all those areas mentioned could provide valuable information to us on. On, on when it is best to test athletes, uh, uh, where to test them during what time of the year. Um, uh, and, and so we use that information, for example, in um, our guidelines uh, on, on, on um, having a, a, a relevant uh, testing program, how to identify athletes from which sports, where, uh, which is uh, the higher risk sports uh, which is the higher risk athletes. Uh, so these are all the medical fields that we use in uh, uh, in developing our strategies, our testing methods, uh, uh, and our, our investigations, and and so on and so forth. I think on the physiological aspects and 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 the other thing about exercises and so on. I'll I'll leave that to Dr. Nick uh, or Aya to uh, to uh, to expand. Thanks, Rodney. Um, Aya or Dr. Nick, you would like to comment? I'm, I hope you saw the question. I put it into the group. Doc, you need to unmute. Mustafa, can you assist us with unmuting Dr. Myonga? Uh, thank you, Anna. Um, the, the, whole, the whole doping control program basically takes cognition of um, the things that Rodney mentioned, where you find that uh, when it comes to substances that are prohibited, you find that uh, they are placed in, on the un, uh, prohibited list if they meet two of um, uh, the three criteria that is used, where you find that uh, we look at substances uh, to check if they are indeed performance enhancing, uh, in terms of all the elements of uh, performance, uh, which is the endurance itself, the recovery itself, uh, and um, a, all those things are looked at from that um, aspect of performance enhancing. If indeed they are against the spirit of sport and also dangerous to the health of the athletes. So what has happened is that uh, a number of substances are also then placed on the monitoring program 
to ensure that uh, research continues to happen in terms of the actual effect that these um, substances would have. So because it has been seen that uh, a number of um, doping uh, issues happen uh, during the preparatory phase, during the training, during the recovery phase, this is why you find that uh, uh, out of competition testing has been a very effective form of um, uh, testing. Uh, talking about um, whereabouts information that is then put in place to ensure that he, at any given point in the value chain of an athlete, all these things are then looked at uh, from an effective doping control program point of view, where the testing is not just happening at the time of competition, but in the whole value chain to ensure that uh, substances that are then marked for uh, this aspect uh, in terms of the prohibited list are effectively uh, looked at. Uh, this is done to make sure that the gap is widened. If you follow also, you will find that equally uh, anti-doping rule violations that you tend to see do not then relate only to the presence of prohibited substances in an athlete sample but you will find that there are a number of cases where you tend to get people missing tests. Uh, it's, it's, it's again uh, for you to get to know that people would violate doping rules by missing tests means that uh, uh, the doping control program then is effective on the basis of trying to make sure that if ever there are any things that are happening outside of the competition area, there is check as far as that um, uh, is concerned. One of the key things that we tend to educate athletes on is the aspect of making sure that all the fundamental principles of training and preparation are adhered to for one to achieve excellence in sports. Frequency, duration, intensity of training, nutrition, psychological support, all those things, they come into play. And this is why even the supplement, supplements discussion is not a huge discussion in terms of sports performance on the basis that we feel that when athletes have met all their nutritional requirements as far as their preparation is concerned, there would be very little or no room as far as the supplements are concerned, as far as that aspect of the discussion is concerned. So uh, the, the, the issues raised here in this question are very pertinent, important issues that we teach athletes on, that we teach athletes coaches on. Every coaching program spoke, speaks of the sports science the exercise science and exercise uh, medicine elements that speaks into preparing an athlete without violating um, anti-doping rules. Thank you, Doc. Aya, did you have a contribution you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I just have a, a brief addition. So just like Dr. Nick mentioned, uh, one is not implicated uh, for anti-doping rule violation just based on analytical findings. And um, I think uh, what the, the person asking the question is alluding is that he actually suspects somebody of uh, doping. And what I know is that some anti-doping organizations and international federations actually do have whistleblower programs uh, through which you can actually report uh, cases, suspected cases of doping, and then the, the relevant anti-doping organizations should be able to uh, investigate the matter while protecting uh, the informant. Yes, so that Thank is you. Uh, one mechanism through which um, uh, it can be re reported. But also uh, another non-analytical mechanism is the intelligence. So uh, even if a prohibited substance is not found um, by presence or through other analytical methods, uh, somebody could actually be suspected of doping and targeted for testing based on his performance. Maybe he was performing at this level two months before and now he's winning at national or regional or continental level. And that is um, another way through which uh, further investigations can be uh, executed. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Is that a hand going up, Rodney? <laughs> Before we go to Kenya, okay. We'll definitely uh, come through um, and, and you know, there's so many different aspects that we're talking about because now you're bringing in Aya, a totally different aspect of issues to do with intelligence and whistleblowing and wow, 
Um, this is another session we're just definitely going to have to have, Mustafa. But I want to now move on to Jafta and say thanks for joining us again. I think we had lost you briefly there, but there's no way we would have let you go, Jafta, without talking to us about the functionality of your anti-doping agency. We look uh, at Kenya and, and see it as being a very functional entity. You've had both challenges, you've had successes. Um, what are the strengths there? What are the strengths that you have there? What systems, what key systems have you put in place uh, in order to, you know, to produce such an effective um, uh, and, and, you know, efficient agency? I was on the website um, just yesterday, I think it was, and your streets ahead of many of us who, you know, don't have that, even that basic re requirement in place where you have a full functional anti-doping based website. So tell us a little bit about your, your systems that you have in place. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Madam Moderator. I'm sorry, uh, my apologies for that uh, glitch in our technical uh, issues here. Glad to join you. Um, let me say this, in Kenya, we are still fairly new, hardly four years now. Um, started in 2016, and uh, even now we still have uh, our teething problems. But I want to mention that uh, we've we've had our own fair rate of success, assisted of course by WADA itself as a major partner, and also the RAD, which is domiciled here in Kenya. We have had also partnerships with other agencies, Antidoping Norway, uh, which has uh, done quite a lot in capacity building our teams here. We've also worked closely with the uh, Antidoping, uh, UK Antidoping, that is UCAT. And so all this has uh, put up a robust Antidoping program in Kenya within that short period of four years. But then also, as mentioned earlier by Rodney, um, we went the whole way and uh, created a legislation uh, through an act of parliament. So some of the enabling uh, documents which we have now in place are an act of parliament, which created the Anti-Doping Agency of Kenya in April of 2016. And out of that, we got the rules. We have an anti-doping policy in place. Uh, and uh, this has now enabled, uh, even in terms of funding, uh, specific funds from the National Treasury uh, to the Anti-Doping Agency of Kenya, uh, which of course now assists us in uh, being able to create the kind of uh, structures that uh, we are talking about. Uh, through this uh, development, we've been able to train um, doping control officers, um, about 50 now. We've been also able to train uh, educators whom we send out to the field to carry out uh, uh, training programs. Also about 50, we trained 30 initially, and then we've trained another additional uh, 20. Sorry, Jeff, so, can I just ask you to your, um, where you've got uh, the sound coming through, maybe you can just lower the volume a little bit because we're getting a bit of feedback. Um, Okay, thanks. We, we are getting a bit of a challenge, I think, within the Okay, building. all right. Uh, but but uh, coming back to what you've said, again, uh, part of the structures that we've been able to put in place uh, are research. I've, I'm, I'm happy to hear from uh, my colleagues, my senior colleague, Rodney, and also from Aya in Uganda about uh, the issue of research, which we feel is uh, quite critical for any anti-doping agency was it gives us uh, something to work on. We've been able to get our risk assessment, for example, from uh, the research which has been done. We have an active uh, research uh, section within the education department. Are you are you online? Are you watching yourself on, fa on Facebook? Uh, no. no. There is a, there is a, there is an echo when you, when you, when you say, when you, when you're talking. Let me try and kill the echo because I think there's another, uh, another. Are you connected with another device also? Just a minute. 
because I'm seeing two Jasper here, like uh, better to uh, with the other device to just uh, lock, lock off on it. So you're not gonna have any echo when you're talking. Are we, are we communicating now? But I think we still have a problem. It's fine, you can keep going, it's all right, it's okay. So coming back, uh, let me uh, try and maybe then uh, summarize what I was saying that uh, through the research that has been undertaken by the research department, we've been able to get uh, um, the data that we require to make our operations uh, almost scientific, I could say. The empirical data that the IA referred to. And uh, as a result of this, we've been able to get uh, even our our tests to be intelligence uh, based. Also together with the intelligence and investigation department, which we've been able to uh, develop, we've been able now also as a result to get um, more accurate uh, work on the ground. Um, coming again to uh, some of the things that have been uh, mentioned earlier, uh, some of the advantage of having um, a specific allocation from the National Treasury, as mentioned by Rodney earlier, even in this pandemic of the COVID-19, we've been able to have our programs uh, ongoing. We've been able to have uh, programs developed, the e-learning platform, for example, which we have on our website. We've been uh, able to develop uh, learning materials uh, for the education department. Tests have continued, of course, even in spite of uh, the challenges that we've had of uh, cessation of movement. Um, and also maybe uh, even the social distancing that has been uh, recommended as a result of uh, this pandemic. With the observation of the protocols given by WADA and also those by our Ministry of Health, we've been able to carry out uh, tests even during this period. So these are some of the advantages that we've been able to um, realize as a result of uh, setting up the anti-doping agency through an act of parliament in 2016. And I would also want to mention that even during this period when we had the challenges of uh, COVID-19, uh, we worked on amendments to our enabling uh, documents, the three of them, the act, the rules, and also the policy. And so all this to us um, point to a situation where we could say that as much as uh, we, we've had, had our challenges and continue to have uh, situations where um, like any other new anti-doping agency with uh, teething problems, uh, we could still say that uh, we have met strides in our um, uh, structures and also in our uh, programs in Kenya. Thank you. Chafta, thank you very much. I think, um, again, it, it points me back to where I spoke about issues of uh, this being pretty daunting um, for organizations that are yet to establish probably uh, what you have in place. And it provides opportunity for stakeholders who are, you know, walking this path to be able to, to learn from you. So I hope it, uh, uh, as, as the Anti-Doping Agency of Kenya, you are opening yourselves to be a uh, knowledge sharing institution. Am I free to say that from an African continental perspective? Yes, uh, I can confirm that, uh, Anne, that uh, we work very closely with uh, our neighbors in the region. For example, we've been able to carry out tests uh, in Uganda on behalf of uh, those counties or on behalf of uh, international federations, uh, both in Tanzania and in Uganda. We've also um, lent some of our staff to train with some of our neighbors, uh, Rwanda, for example. Um, and currently, the RAD on five is uh, is working closely with the Department of uh, Compliance and Testing, uh, so that they can use uh, some of the staff who have been trained, both by Antidoping Norway and also um, 
um, UCAT, UKN, and, and the topping, uh, so that they can also build the capacities of uh, our neighbors. We look at this as uh, providing uh, an African solution uh, to our problems in the region. And we'll continue working and partnering with our, our neighbors, our, uh, our friends in the region so as to develop uh, their capacities. The way that uh, ADNA, for example, helped us uh, mm -hmm. to develop uh, our capacity. Thank you so much, uh, Jafta. Um, Mustafa, I'm gonna cross over to you quickly to let us know whether there are any particular questions we may have in place before we do an overall summation of our discussion today. Do we have any questions? Uh, for now, no. Uh, the only question that we had is that, that one I sent to you through, uh, through, through WhatsApp. And I'm gonna be uh, checking again uh, the Facebook and I will let you know. That's great. Thanks, Mustafa. Um, I think, colleagues, what is really interesting is, as I, as, as I said to you, I think sometimes this is a very daunting subject matter. And uh, we have a lot of work to do to make sure that we bring as many people on board. And before I now give each person at least two to three minutes just to wind up, some of the key points that I feel came through were very related to uh, the doping anti-doping pro, uh, program still being very in its youthful stage. Um, we still have an insufficient uh, holding or gathering of NADOs, which needs to be strengthened by um, commitment at government level, such as acts of parliament, uh, the revised of code, which is coming through with the revised standards, which obviously need enactment, um, code compliance at an individual level now, rather than more collectively, um, we have to build capacities within the RADOs. Um, often you find probably the wrong people assigned to such key assignments as anti-doping. Uh, Aya, you, you pointed out the steps you've taken to raise awareness in education. And just now from, from Kenya, we've heard how important it is to have that legislative support that allows you, regardless of the times we're going through, um, to still carry on with your very critical activities because life as we know it will carry on. So just having picked up on some of those points, Rodney, um, I'll invite you to just give us uh, a summation um, just before you, we go through in terms of how you feel this, uh, the roles and responsibilities are being carried out on the continent from a global perspective. Uh, th thank you, thank you, Anna. Um, I, I'm, I'm very heartened by the level of the discussions and I think the points raised by, by our colleagues. I mean, we are a big continent, but within the anti-doping field, we tend to know everybody. So it, it was good to sit back and listen to the experiences in Kenya and Uganda and, uh, and the, the RADO in, in, in Southern Africa, because uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I've been involved with most of these processes and I can see the development that has taken place. Anna, one of the things that if any other message goes out today, uh, which I believe is critical, it is that if we want to make anti-doping succeed, we need to ensure that we address uh, the global anti-doping program is only as strong as its weakest link. Our athletes do not uh, operate and play and participate and compete in isolation. They participate in, 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 in a much bigger uh, setup. And therefore, it is important that whether you are from the USA, whether you are from Uganda, from South Africa, from Kenya, from uh, China, everybody must be, um, uh, everybody is in the same boat and everybody is expected uh, to have a program in place. One of the things I believe strongly in, and it's some, something that I'm advocating wherever and whenever I have an opportunity to do so, is, 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 is to say that if we want to do something, we can do it. We must have the political will, the political strength and the political conviction uh, to act on these things. Too many times it's lip service to a lot of things. Uh, and, and I think uh, Aya mentioned the situation in Uganda um, and, and she has uh, did an analysis of what they need to do, what the shortcomings are. Uh, and, and I think that with political will, I'm not talking about just the government, I'm talking about 
all the institutions in the country, if there is a will, there is a way. Kenya, if I may, uh, Jafta, with, with, with your permission, I had to, go, had to take another route where they were declared non-compliant, which raised the, the, the level of understanding in the country uh, on why it is important that such a structure exists. The reality is that Kenyan athletes participated globally, uh, won uh, lots of medals, make us all very proud. Uh, and the question that their competitors asked is, are you also tested like we are tested in our countries? And, and those are the type of questions that the government of Kenya had to answer to when there were cases and when they did not have a program in place. Uh, I mean, Kenya is now for me uh, a, a jewel in Africa, um, having gone through all of that and are putting in place uh, the relevant structures, but it, it came down to, do you really want to do it? Yes, then do it with conviction, with resourcing, with political support, with the necessary instrument to make this thing work. Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much, Rodney, and, and you know, for just covering all the other aspects um, addressed. I am just gonna come to you before I go to Dr. Nick, because uh, there are two questions that we've picked up. And um, the first question says, you mentioned that you are carrying awareness in anti-doping through education. Can you please assist uh, in advising how are you actually reaching out to the athletes? And the second one is what are the under, what do you think are the underlying issues that make athletes dope? Secondly, uh, what are your organization strategies in reaching more athletes for information? So those questions were from Abel and from Joseph. Uh, thank you, Anna, for those questions, which are all very relevant. So I would like to start with uh, the question on raising awareness. And I believe this is about raising awareness uh, among all stakeholders, from athletes to entourage to public authorities and to sports administrators. So firstly, I would like to say that um, at the level of sports administrators, national federations and entourage, the National Olympic Committee of Uganda has really deliberately taken uh, steps to train uh, hundreds and probably even over thousands of uh, sports administrators in management. And this includes anti-doping education. So our anti-doping educator is heavily involved in this and he actually does participate in uh, uh, in this uh, sports management courses, teaching about all aspects and different aspects of anti-doping. But uh, with regard to uh, the initiatives we have for athletes, I have to admit that because we have limited resources, we have decided to set priorities and target uh, specific groups of athletes that have specifically high needs. We know that they are going to be targeted for testing or they are going to be tested and uh, uh, they need to be well prepared. So we do have uh, preparatory sessions for national teams that are going, for example, for international events and also continental events. And uh, in these anti-doping education seminars, we tell them, uh, <clears throat> we start from the basics, what anti-doping is, and that it's not just about uh, using and being caught for using a prohibited substance. We teach them about the doping control process such that if they're actually notified for testing, they know what is going to happen. They know that someone is actually going to observe them passing out urine. Because if you don't know this, it can really, you know, it can be dehumanizing actually. So we, we, we have a very practical demonstration of what happens when you're notified, when you're taken to the doping control station, how to control the, how to handle the doping control equipment and what the doping control forms look like, what you're going to write, what they're going to ask you that you need to sign. And so that our athletes are really prepared. And then secondly, we have also conducted outreaches at events <clears throat> at uh, various competitions so that you know, we are not just targeting specific athletes, but where we have multi-sports events and we can actually reach uh, a vast group of athletes, then 
we are there. But I have to also say that the COVID situation has affected us in uh, very many ways. While uh, WADA has actually provided lots of uh, relevant resources for athletes uh, on Adele and other platforms, as well as webinars, this is quite difficult for other athletes because um, when you look at Uganda and uh, let's say the rural electrification, uh, we don't have a, a stable uh, connection of electricity in the remote areas where our uh, long distance athletes, for example, are training at high altitude. That's one issue. Then another issue is that in those areas, we also don't have good internet connectivity. So it has been very challenging for us to do any kind of education or awareness seminars targeting specifically athletes because of uh, these issues around electricity, internet. And I have to say that, um, I mean, we, we are actually lucky that materials are in English and most of our athletes do understand English, but probably not as much as they would understand their native language. So actually, um, we are thinking of getting in touch with the Anti-Doping Agency of Kenya because we found out that they do have resources and materials for athletes in Swahili. And I think that would be important for us. And then, sorry, what, what was the second question? Well, well Aya, yeah. it, it, the question was about, mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I want to use the term very loosely, what are the underlying issues that make athletes dope? why is that we're not going to ask you uh, if you ever felt that kind of pressure but i think just generally and it's a question i'll also pose to um uh, our colleague in kenya as well maybe you know they've had experiences where they've seen uh, reasons why but maybe you can just give us two reasons and then we'll pass it on to kenya as well Okay, and it's good that you've mentioned that the reasons are so many because honestly i can't exhaust them but yeah. one key thing is that of course, there are athletes who use uh, prohibited substances with the intention to dope. But mm -hmm. there are also instances where athletes are, uh, find themselves in a place where they have, uh, th there is a prohibited substance in their bodies mm -hmm. um, without uh, their intention to dope. So th that is the key point. And I want to highlight this because in Uganda, we have actually realized that some athletes have used certain prohibited substances, not necessarily with the intention to do, but because they didn't have the knowledge on prohibited substances, they don't know what can be, what cannot be used all the time, what is prohibited in competition. So this ended up finding uh, them on the wrong side of the rules, although yeah. they did not have the intention to do. And also we need to realize that our pharmaceutical market is not as yeah. regulated as other parts of the world. So a lot of the products that we find on the market, especially supplements, could be contaminated with prohibited substances and athletes do take uh, these supplements. Thanks, Aya. Um, that's, a, that's another topic for another day. And I think Africa Talk Sports needs to take note of that. But Kenya, do you have a comment to make? What I found interesting on your website yesterday was, um, and I'm sorry, I, I, I'm just trying to remember the terminology, but you had the sanctions, you had a list of sanctions. And, you know, I, I looked at every single section and I was just really fascinated that, you know, you bring out and you produce all of that information. It means that the system is in place and functional. One of the questions was, um, what are your organizational strategies in reaching out to more athletes and giving them information? Maybe you could highlight that for us quickly. Yeah, I think um, it's true that uh, like uh, the Ugandan case, there could be a lot of uh, our athletes who may have uh, prohibited substances entering their bodies without their knowledge. But we also want to be conscious of the fact that uh, there is peer pressure. Some of these athletes uh, talk to each other. Some of them look at uh, the success stories of uh, their colleagues. Some of them think maybe the riches that their neighbors um, who have participated in sports in the past 
uh, could be because they used some, or maybe they 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 crossed the line faster than their their colleagues and their friends, and uh, then they would be tempted to use anything to reach that point. So there, there is a lot of that. The motivation could be uh, uh, quick uh, success, quick reaches as a result of that quick success. Um, so what we do, we try and approach it uh, more in terms of education, education, more education, and more education, uh, to the point that uh, we would not wish a situation where before the tribunal, uh, which listens to these uh, anti-doping cases, we hear a situation where an athlete says that he did not know. Because it, it pains me, for example, when I hear that, uh, coming from uh, you know the defense of an athlete that he didn't know about that uh, prohibited substance. So we want them to know that is the first approach. We make this information as readily available as possible as even uh, uh, my sister Aya has mentioned, we even translated it, some of the materials into the local languages, Kiswahili. For example, we might go the whole way and translate to other uh, local languages so that because some of the talent, the raw talent we have uh, you know, people who have not even gone through secondary school or who have not gone to college, uh, straight from uh, the rural areas, primary schools, and we want them to have that knowledge, even though um, they have not been exposed to the, you know, the outside world. So we, we will continue to uh, spearhead the issue of uh, education, but we also urge the federations, and, and this is where we, we have uh, strong partnerships with some of the and national federations, athletics, Kenya, for example, that they should have a pool of uh, doctors available for their members who can advise. Well, some of the cases could be just a simple therapeutic use exemption uh, situation, but we find a lot of uh, the athletes uh, would go the whole way and uh, use a substance, not knowing that it has a prohibited substance, and yet they could even have uh, been suffering from a medical ailment which could have allowed them uh, through a TV process uh, to use that uh, medicine and not be uh, sanctioned when the, the substance is found in his sample. So th this, it's a complex uh, situation. We want to get it right from the ground. But as I've said, uh, when you look at uh, some of the athletes who have uh, been found um, guilty of some of the infringements to these uh, rules, there is a possibility that uh, peer pressure uh, and also influence uh, from other quarters uh, could have led to them using the prohibited substance. So we need to work together, together with the federations, together with the medical practitioners. We have a good partnership with our agency in charge of uh, pharmacy and, and you know, uh, poisons board, uh, so that um, the people they license to dispense drugs because as uh, I has also correctly said, you know, um, control of some of these substances is not as uh, in other countries. Some of the substances can be found across the counter, you know, just over the counter uh, uh, dispensing. So again, who controls that? It might not be the Antidoping Agency of Kenya, but another body of uh, uh, the government, uh, which is in charge of that. And we are working closely to ensure that we, we seal all those loopholes that we don't have a situation where some of the prohibited substances uh, can find their way to our athletes um, without them knowing or without any control being put in place. Thanks so much, Jafta, for that. And, and what's so key is, you know, as young as we are in this drive for uh, anti-doping education, you know, being so critical, it's about affecting long-term behavioral change that, that we're really going to have to work very hard at this. So just as a, a, my final contributor, I'm going to come to you, Dr. Myunga, based on some comments um, that we received. Um, specifically, I got one from Christine that says, there's ever increasing expectation on stakeholders by the code with very minimal resources available to meet these needs. I'm smiling, Rodney. What will WADA do to bridge the gap between developing and developed NADOs and programs? But I just wanted to tie it in, Dr. Myunga, maybe to get your comment on um, advocacy for political support, as Rodney had said. How can the WADA and the RADO facilitate 
this change that or the changes that we're coming through, you know, how do they work together? What's the best way for working together? You spoke about how um, the Rados will still have responsibility, but how can they assist with that transition? What do you think are the key areas? Is it education? Is it the testing side? What do you think will help us individual uh, anti-doping entities to rise up to the level that we are expected to be operating at? Sorry, Doc, you'll have to unmute. Mustafa, can you assist us? Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Thanks, thanks Mustafa. Thanks, um, Anna. <clears throat> I think um, uh, basically there is quite a lot of work um, um, as far as issues of um, the political will generation is concerned. Uh, speaking for uh, the Africa Zone 6 RADO, when it was established, established in 2006, the ministers of sports the presidents of the National Olympic Committee were all together in one room uh, talking about uh, their commitment from a government point of view, from a sports movement point of view, that they would be committed as far as the um, anti-doping uh, movement is concerned. Where the governments were committing themselves to provide the political will as far as issues related to legislation is concerned, issues related to funding budgets is concerned. And you'll find that uh, when Rodney say uh, most of these have been reduced to talk shows, he is talking from an experience point of view where he has been in contact with the ministers directly in some situations with the presidents of countries directly and the commitment from a word of mouth point of view has been extended as far as anti-doping activities um, are concerned. But in my view, in some instances, it is not really limited to uh, how the politicians would have accepted and committed to go forward, but how the technicians take up the button to me sometimes is where we drop the ball on the basis that if a council of ministers have put down a communique as far as their commitment to anti-doping is concerned, in my view, they would have done their job. It is upon us, the technocrats, the people now running the ministries in governments to seriously commit themselves to follow issues to the later in terms of what it is that needs to be done uh, is concerned. It is upon us, the technicians, in terms of implementing the issues related to the World Anti-Doping Court are concerned. How can we uh, form a national, a regional anti-doping organization in 2006? And in 2020, we are still delegating responsibilities on education doping control testing, therapeutic use exemption, results management to the regional anti-doping organization. What have we done as technocrats in our own rights? We should be doing these things as the individual member states. And today, if you look at the issues that we have found to be lacking, that we should now be delegating to the regional anti-doping organization would now relate to issues of intelligence and investigations, research, where the regional anti-doping organization can now cross-pollinate the issues of universities within the regions, within the continent, that can assist in terms of research, whilst the issues of education, issues of testing would have been relegated to be done by the individual member countries, even without having uh, done and uh, having had uh, formation of the national anti-doping organization themselves. So to me, there is quite a lot of commitment political that he is the outside of the politicians. That's to, that we need to push through as the technocrats as far as issues of this nature are concerned. Which country has had a meeting where the National Olympic Committee people 
the Ministry of Sports People and the Sports Commissions have joined hands and say, let's go and talk to the minister and speak with one voice because we want this to move. To me, once you start getting the technocrats to occupy that space, there will be movement. The politicians are as good as people around them when technical matters come into play. And to me, I am not challenging the politicians. They come and go. You may have to find that in most of our countries in the past 10 years, the ministers of sport have been either three or four in a country, but the directors of sport have remained the same. Why has things not moved? So we want to hide behind the politicians on the political will, but the political will lies with the technocrats to get things to move. This is my concern. This is what I think must be able to drive the uh, anti-doping drive uh, will and not hide behind the politicians. They come and go and technocrats remain. So we have a role to play as technocrats if we want to achieve much more. A new minister can still come today and find that the legislation for anti-doping has been drafted. Who is he not to then pursue it and take it to parliament and cabinet? But if we don't, they will still find the space that was there when the other minister was there and nothing moves and we blame that the minister is new. The minister does not put these drafts. The minister does not run with anti-doping programs. The minister comes to ask, so where are we as far as this and that is concerned? And if we brief them, they take it up and we make progress. That is my contribution. I cannot say a word after that, uh, Rodney. I think you understand. <laughs> cannot say a word after that, Doctor. Um, absolutely true. And this is why I say it becomes very daunting because it is, it is technical. It is not just general at all. But I think we've had a fantastic discussion session today. I know uh, James has got one more comment and absolutely in 30 seconds, Rodney, can you just comment on um, uh, one we have in, in the chat that says capacity discrepancies exist between countries and also between RADOs. WADA encouraging capacity crossbreeding between RADOs to create a more homogenous capacity level across the continent. You have 30 seconds. Yes, thank you, Anna. And, and this also ties in with a question from Christine. I, I, I'm not sure if, if it's Christine uh, from Nairobi, uh, but I see that with James Sekajugo asking the question, Uganda is very well represented. Uh, I think, um, uh, James, very good question, and Christine as well. As I said, um, the anti-doping system, we cannot have four different systems, one for developed, one for developing, one for non-existent and non for not even uh, a thought yet uh, we we need to have one system and and therefore it is important as i mentioned earlier on the complete global anti-doping system is only as strong as its weakest link it is therefore import very important and it is for that reason that we as wada that we invest heavily in program development the rado program as much as the rados don't belong to wada we have played a critical role and a supporting role in getting the RADOs to exist. And we support their programs, we support their training. Uh, same with na national anti-doping organizations, we invest heavily in supporting them. Now, uh, unfortunately, uh, we can't, as I mentioned, Christine, we can't have a developing and a developed one. But what we are doing is to get people to sit together to collaborate, which is what we said earlier on, to collaborate and to partner. One of the projects we have as the Africa office is to have a partnership forum where the region, Africa, can sit and say, well, how do we uh, use the expertise in the one country to to build capacity in another country, that we do it within the region, as we normally say, let's find African solutions to the problems. Then if Kenya can assist uh, Uganda, if Uganda can assist Tanzania, if Tanzania can assist Rwanda, I think we are making a lot of progress. So the partnerships, is, it's, it's, it's a, a definite program of WADA and something that my office is pursuing. We already have several agreements drafted between 
uh, NADOs in different countries in the region. And we want to expand on that. So that is what we are going to do. So James, you are covered. It's absolutely a, a program that we have. And it's only also not only NADO to NADO, but also how RADOs can assist other RADOs, how RADOs can assist the NADO mem uh, NADOs in their member countries. So these... Um, uh, partnerships and collaborations it's a it's a key strategy in 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 what we uh what we need to do and what we want to do and and that is where we are putting our money thanks anna thank you so much rodney couldn't have summed it up better and um just to highlight that this has been a discussion on the global anti-doping program talking about responsibilities and roles and it's been brought to you by Africa Talk Sports um, to Mustafa and the team. We really appreciate uh, your having put this together. I think the work that has to be done is still massive. The discussions are still um, so many. Maybe just looking around the screen, I, I want to recognize Agnes for being on board. NOC president from Zambia, I see you there. We have South Sudan. Um, and quite a few, and we, we had a knocker uh, TD earlier. Yes, hello. I can see the waving. Yes, hello. <laughs> Sorry, Kali. Um, it's been really great to have this, um, just an open discussion. And I think opportunities like this are very, very critical to making sure we're all, um, as Rodney rightly puts it, we're not trying to create 17 different juggling acts, but Excellence is excellence and it is one, and that is what we are targeting. So at this stage, I'd just like to thank you. My name's Anam Guni from Zimbabwe, and I want to thank you very much for having listened to my drone voice for so long. And I'm going to hand you over to the MD of Africa Talk Sports, Mustafa. Thank you, Mustafa. Mustafa? Oh, sorry, <laughs> I, I I forgot to unmute myself. Yeah. So thank you very much, Anna, and thank you very much to all of you uh, for the quality of the debate uh, today and the enthusiasm you have shown by sharing your experiences uh, and knowledge, which may has made this uh, conference a success that once again exceed our expectation. So many thanks to Aya, to Rudney, to Chapter, Nicola and to our moderator, Anna, and to all the participants for taking part of uh, this panel. So see you uh, at our next sessions, and thank you. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Thank you.